please be sure to say hello in the chat session. Uh, tell us where you're from and uh, maybe give us some of your impressions of the first day of the conference. That would be great. And uh, if you haven't already, please follow us on Twitter um, using the Twitter uh, hashtag. I've seen a couple, Eden20 and Eden2020. Um, if you have questions, please enter them in the Q&A area. We will not be following questions that are posted in chat, so please be sure to post them there. Uh, you can also follow the conference uh, from the Eden website um, uh, using YouTube. So good morning, everyone. We're just waiting for everyone to file into the room this morning. And before we start, we're gonna wait a couple more minutes. Uh, if you haven't already, please say hello in the uh, chat box and tell us a little bit about where you're from, maybe your impressions of the conference from the first day. Welcome to day two of the Eden Annual Conference in Tima Sawara or virtually in Tima Sawara. Uh, and uh, please enter your questions in the Q&A area of the uh, Zoom um, conference. This is where we'll be reviewing the questions and then feeding them to our speakers uh, once they're finished. Our speakers will be giving their presentations and then we'll have a couple of questions and if there's time at the end, we'll answer more questions. So please say hello. And if you uh, want to know the program, uh, what's coming up for today, please be sure to check out the Eden website uh, as well as uh, you can also access the live streaming link from there. going to be a big day today. There's a lot of a lot of presentations, a lot of workshops. Today is also the micro HE day uh, where people will be learning about the results of the EU project, uh, looking at micro credentials. Uh, so and we're very excited to have our speakers with us today. So all right, I think I'm going to go ahead and start. Uh, we have a really great lineup this morning of speakers to talk to us about the topic of the co conference, artificial intelligence. Our first speaker today is Professor Demetria Sampson, who will be followed by Denise Whitlock, and then Anthony Camilleri will be speaking. So uh, each speaker will have about half an hour uh, to, to speak, and then we'll have a little time for questions and answers, uh, and then we should be wrapping up around 10.30. So let me start out with uh, Professor Demetria Sampson, um, who is engaged in teaching and research in the field of learning technologies and digital learning since 1996. He is the co-author of 350 articles in scientific books, journals, and conferences, and the editor of 15 books, 35 special issues in academic journals, and 40 international conference proceedings with more than 6,000 citations. Very impressive. Uh, he's been director, principal investigator, and or research consultant in 70 research and innovation projects. Professor Sampson supervised 155 honors and postgraduate students to successful completion. Currently, he leads an international university industry consortium called Learn to Analyze that promotes professional development and educational data literacy for online education and training professionals and higher education students. He is also the recipient of the IEEE Computer Society Distinguished Service Award in July 2012 and named a Golden Core member of IEEE Computer Society and the Golden Nikola Tesla Chain Award of the International Society for Engineering Pedagogy. So uh, the topic of his, to uh, of his keynote today is educational data analytics, combining human and machine intelligence in online teaching and learning. And Dimitri, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Lisa. I think it was a nice introduction. Uh, uh, I will um, indeed talk about uh, educational data analytics, uh, but um, I have um, decided to adjust a little bit the topic to the current uh, situation uh, that we are all facing all around the world with, uh, with uh, the health uh, emergency situation. Uh, so basically, uh, I will uh, talk a little bit, I will focus a little bit more on the educational data literacy, which is something that of more practical use nowadays for um, most of the uh, people uh, who are uh, engaged in teaching and learning, either at higher education or at school education. So my presentation 
uh, will be around educational data literacy, the challenges and the opportunities, especially under the current circumstances and the follow-up situations that we all expect in the different parts of the world, uh, the changes that we anticipate that will happen uh, uh, in teaching and learning because of the experience of the coronavirus. Uh, I'll provide some definitions and then also uh, some examples from, from a project that we're running now in Europe uh, related with educational data literacy. So I'll start with the challenges and opportunities of educational data literacy. Now, um, um, I think that even if there were some doubts uh, uh, in the past, Today, um, all over the world, everybody thinks that everybody accepts that digital teaching and learning is indeed a key innovation for both teaching and learning at the university, but also for a, a, a professional development and vocational training. And it's actually what has kept ed education alive uh, and alive uh, during this uh, health crisis. So to this end, uh, blended and online courses are nowadays widely used to meet the needs of um, uh, both uh, uh, higher education, vocational training students and in-service professionals, but nowadays also uh, for, uh, for uh, 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 high school uh, uh, students as well. Uh, at the core of, uh, um, of these um, uh, courses, obviously, are uh, the uh, course or the learning management systems. And uh, yesterday, you had a presentation by um, Martin Duyamas. Uh, he, he presented the case of Moodle that most of the uh, people are actually uh, familiar with. Uh, uh, and um, it's actually one of the most widely used uh, uh, platforms uh, in terms of uh, man course management systems uh, worldwide, especially because it's open access. So, <clears throat> within this context, the, the design, the delivery, the evaluation and the redesign of high quality online and blended learning courses and learning experiences are nowadays at the core of the discussion about education and training in, 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 in really in most parts of the world. I receive invitations uh, to, to, to con both consult but also provide uh, lectures and, and training in, in many parts of the world nowadays in this context. Um, the two important professional roles uh, 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 that have been actually um, become a little bit more uh, visible and they emerged, of course, in the US, they were already uh, uh, visible and, and emerged uh, 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 for a long time, but now in other parts of the world, including Europe, they are become, uh, these two professional roles that become quite important, is the instruction designers, the ones who design and develop uh, online and blended learning courses, and the trainers and tutors who can support and deliver these online and blended courses. These are two uh, a, a new professional roles, not new really, but two professional roles that they have uh, received lots of attention uh, um, during this uh, crisis. And many people around the world, they actually realize now that schools of education need to be able to prepare uh, um, uh, uh, the, the, the students for these two roles. The role of the instructional designer and the role of the professional trainers and tutors who can support uh, online courses. And indeed, um, within this context, new professional competencies are required for, for these two uh, professional roles, uh, especially taking into consideration the current, uh, uh, the current developments, the mass use of uh, online uh, and blended teaching and learning, uh, not only in higher education professional development, but also in school education. Um, a recent advancement in, uh, in online and blended learning has been the educational data analytics. And uh, you are quite familiar, yesterday there were a couple of the presentations on, on data analytics. Basically, it's actually the use of uh, educational data which are generated during teaching and learning, including also the different methods of assessment that we use for better supporting individual learners in online but also in blended courses. This becomes very popular nowadays, especially with uh, um, uh, so, such a large-scale uh, implementation of online uh, um, uh, learning experiences uh, in, 
in, in school and higher education. Uh, I can tell here that I had the experience from uh, uh, working in, in Australia for uh, the past uh, uh, almost uh, five years, uh, first full time and now part time, uh, as, as uh, Australian universities are fully online and we offer all our courses uh, online for many years now. Uh, and therefore, there is lots of experience there and all these issues that we discussed today in some parts of the world, like Australian higher education, are already uh, in the, the daily uh, uh, practice uh, that uh, we use. So, coming back to the educational data analytics, uh, most of the course management systems, including Moodle, they incorporate educational data analytics tools. However, these tools are not widely, widely used. In a recent survey that I did with teachers in different countries, not only in Europe, but in different continents as well, in, in, in China as well, and in, in Asia, uh, and, and in Australia, uh, um, not that many teachers in school education, but also uh, 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 teachers, at, uh, uh, tutors at higher education, are actually using the educational data analytics tools that are incorporated in most course management systems, either Moodle or uh, Blackboard or the others. Uh, and um, one of the reasons that they are not actually used is because uh, um, the professionals who are supposed to uh, use them, they have very, they report having very low educational data literacy competencies uh, uh, through their professional development or the initial studies. So it, it is a fact that, that professionals, either instructional designers and trainers, or even K-12 uh, teachers and higher education uh, tutors, uh, um, who use and adopt online or blended learning strategies, they are actually lacking educational data literacy competencies in most parts of the world. What is educational data literacy? It's actually a core competence for all educational professionals, including schools, school teachers, instructional designers, tutors, uh, even educational uh, um, institution leaders. Uh, um, it's basically the, the, the capability of collecting and analyzing data uh, which are relevant either at micro level uh, for, for uh, um, um, analyzing teaching and learning in your classroom activities or even in a meso and macro level related with taking decisions at a higher level. Nevertheless, most of the ex existing professional competence frameworks for educators, they pay very little attention on, on educational data literacy. They are missing out the potential of using these methods and tools in online and blended learning teaching. Therefore, there is a need, and this is one of the thesis I bring in this uh, presentation, there is a need for extending the existing professional competence frameworks for educators with new competence that they can accommodate the emerging field of educational data literacy. There are also very limited professional development courses for cultivating educational data literacy competencies. Therefore, there is also a need for developing uh, professional development programs that they can uh, uh, develop, but also assess educational data literacy competencies. Uh, so, I'll give some definition about educational data literacy uh, uh, before I move to, the, uh, uh, to, to, to what we have already done in this field. So, um, basically, it's about collecting and organizing uh, 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 data that are either, I call them profiling data and interaction data. Uh, profiling data are data that can help us profile uh, either the students or even the learning environment, in some cases, even, even the teachers or the course. And interaction data are the data that uh, are created by the interaction or and between the three different entities that they play a, 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 a role in, in, a, in teaching and learning, the students, the teachers, and the learning environment, usually a, a digital learning environment. And these data are both uh, qualitative, but also they are derived both with qualitative, which is the most uh, a, a quantitative method. Quantitative methods are probably the most commonly used. Qualitative methods are a little bit more difficult, but I think they are also very important for the educational data collection and analysis. 
So data literacy, another definition, data literacy for education is the ability to understand and use data effectively so as to inform educational and pedagogical decisions. Education, I use the, the different words, educational for, for the uh, macro and meso level and pedagogical for the micro level, the classroom-based uh, level decision. So it's basically a set of competencies that help educators to locate, to collect, to analyze and understand, to interpret and act upon educational data from different sources so that they can support the improvement of teaching, learning and the assessment process. Uh, this is an overview of, uh, uh, of uh, the uh, data literacy for an educator. Yes? I'm so sorry. I just wanted to drag your attention that you haven't started your slides. You keep talking, only you. I'm so sorry for this. No, but, but I thought that I share my screen. No, you didn't. I'm sorry. I, I kept texting you, but this is why I have to start. Oh, well, no, don't text me because I'm not going to see... Uh, yeah, because I, I knew that yeah. I, I knew that you so, have a presentation. So uh, maybe if you uh, can, if yeah. you can quickly Do I just share go the over the images. Yes, you can go now on on uh, slideshow uh, and just go briefly over them, but don't speak. Yeah, 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 I'm yeah, sorry yeah. for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no worry. No, you should have interrupted me before. Uh, so this is uh, this is the slides anyway, uh, but but it's basically text. So. So now this is the this is a figure probably that people can see. Uh, is that okay now, Diana? Yes, that's perfect. You look very good. Thank you so much, Dimitris. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. No worries. No worries. Because we tested before, and I was sharing my screen. I didn't realize that I had to redo that. So educational data technologies, there are different type of uh, educational data technologies. There are teaching analytics, which are methods uh, and uh, tools that can help you visualize and analyze and assess uh, teaching uh, practice. There are learning analytics, uh, which most of the people are actually familiar with, uh, which are the methods and tools for collect and analyze and report student-related educational data, uh, mainly uh, towards monitoring the learning process. And the combination of the two, which is the teaching and learning analytics, which in my view is the most interesting part, and um, uh, the reason why is the reason I'm saying that it's the most interesting part is because um, the only the learning analytics part, the analysis of the learning process without analyzing the teaching practice, uh, that is the context where the learning is taking place, is probably giving us a very limited view of uh, uh, what is actually happening in the teaching and learning process. So teaching and learning analytics are uh, the, the methods and the tools that can support the process of reflective practice, facilitating the teacher to actually go back and reflect on their teaching design, using evidence from the actual delivery and the feedback that they can receive and the actions uh, of the, the analysis of the actions of the students. So these are the three different categories of educational data analytics technologies and tools as far as I see them today. I know that most of the people are talking about learning analytics. I, we have introduced the term of teaching analytics and the combination of the two. Um, the reason why teaching analytics are, are, are useful is not only, uh, and I will insist a little bit on that because I know that you have lots of uh, input from the learning analytics side, is not only for the self-reflection and improvement, that is, you know, there are tools that can help you visualize the elements of a lesson plan or can uh, help you um, uh, visualize and align a, a lesson plan with educational objectives and standards. Uh, there are also tools that they have some kind of intelligence, and here is the, oh, the artificial intelligence uh, part that can help you to validate, for example, a lesson plan with potential in inconsistencies in its design especially when it comes to applying strategies like uh, or principles like constructive alignment and things like that. But it's not only for self-reflection uh, improvement. Uh, teaching analytics can help us, especially in cases of mass uh, and large-scale adoption of online uh, uh, courses, to share with peers uh, um, uh, uh, your work, your lesson plans, for example, and your activities in the classroom, okay? And uh, your experience of this uh, uh, lessons with your, with your students. So share them both with peers, but in case of non not so experienced uh, 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 teachers, and that was the case actually nowadays, uh, uh, the past few months with the, uh, the coronavirus crisis, because many uh, people uh, 
uh, they were quite even experienced teachers. They weren't very experienced in in actually moving uh, uh, their activities online. Therefore, the phenomenon was that we had many younger and, and uh, uh, teachers uh, with less experience in teaching and learning, but more experience on using uh, digital tools to act as mentors. Uh, 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 to the uh, more experienced teachers, but not very familiar with digital technologies. As a result, uh, um, the way that things have developed, especially in Greece, but in other parts of the world as well, as I have observed, is that communities of teachers were actually created. And therefore, the teaching analytics got to support each other. And therefore, tools like teaching analytics can help these communities to share what they're doing share their experiences, but also to start working as peers in analyzing and annotating common teaching designs and have some kind of co-reflection and shared experiences in a more, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, transparent uh, way. Uh, so therefore, I insist that uh, I highlight that teaching analytics probably something that can be useful in large scale implementation of online education, in, uh, especially in school education. Uh, I'm not going to go in details on the learning analytics. You have seen uh, uh, probably quite a few presentations and you will see much, many, many more. I can highlight though that uh, mainly I see learning analytics as a tool for, for build and update individual student profiles, keeping track, track of uh, uh, what an individual student uh, 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 can do. Uh, and there are different types of learner data that uh, we are interested in. It's not only the engagement and the performance, but it's also the emotional data that I feel are very relevant, especially in the situation that uh, we faced with the coronavirus crisis. Emotional data became extremely important, like stress or anxiety or boredomness in, uh, within the context of online uh, courses. And I suggested to many people that this is probably a good opportunity for doing a little bit more research on this particular topic, the use of motion, the, the collection, the use of motion and data, of course, overcoming all the issues with the uh, uh, ethical restrictions and uh, privacy and things like that. Um, so I still think that this is an interesting topic. If there are people who are interested in, in, in doing more research, I will I would love to get in contact with them on this particular topic. So the different type of uh, technologies that they are used in educational data analytics are the descriptive analytics, where we can say what happened in the past uh, based on analyzing the past data. Uh, this is useful, but not very useful. The predictive analytics, uh, so we can predict future trends based on uh, uh, identifying uh, patterns, and uh, uh, things like that, uh, uh, from, uh, from the analysis past data. But what is more interesting, to be honest, is actually the prescriptive analytics. What we could do or should do, should be a little bit strong, what we could do. So basically a recommender system that's based on analytics, what kind of recommendations for actions can be provided based on the analysis of this data. This is where the artificial intelligence algorithms are coming and that's why it's a very relevant topic for a machine intelligence system. Now, within this context, because I need to probably rush a little bit up, within this context, we have a, 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 we, we developed a, a European project called Learn to Analyze. It's, it's, it's about a, 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 a promoting educational data literacy. It's, a, it's, a, 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 it's an academia and industry a knowledge alliance a, a program that uh, provides, uh, brings together um, uh, both academic partners and industrial partners. Uh, the scope of the Learn to Analyze project was to enhance existing professional development frameworks for instructional designers and new tutors to include educational data literacy competencies uh, in a response to the challenge that I described before, and also to develop and evaluate a professional development uh, MOOC uh, for, for pro promoting these uh, competencies in, uh, in uh, uh, school teachers, instructional designers, and e-trainers. Um, therefore, the, the main outcomes of this project have been a complete educational data literacy competence profile, I'll show you a snapshot of that, and a, a MOOC 
with a certificate of achievement on educational data literacy under the European uh, uh, Commission umbrella. And of course, they, they could, they, they, uh, to generate a professional community around this topic in Europe and in the world. Um, this is uh, this is the snapshot of, of course, I'll leave my, the slides with the, the organizers so we can have access to the slides that will be as, as a file to download in my presentation. This is a, a snapshot of the educational data literacy competence profile that we have provided uh, with the um, uh, I'm not going to go in details here, but for each uh, dimension of competencies, there are statements, competence statements related with this dimension. You can see that it's not only about collection of data management and analysis, uh, but also about the comprehension and interpretation in terms of education, the application, the use of this in order to take decisions in, uh, in uh, pedagogical and educational decisions. But also an important topic is actually the data ethics uh, related with privacy and all the other issues that are relevant in, uh, when we use data, especially in sensitive uh, areas as, 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 as education. And so within this context, we have developed a MOOC. Uh, we ran this uh, MOOC uh, uh, last year for uh, eight weeks. We had more than 2,000 enrollments eventually. And um, uh, the, the interesting part was that almost 50%, which is actually quite high, uh, of the people who enrolled actually completed and got their certificate, creating a community of around 1,000 people, mainly from Europe, but also in other parts of the world, that they have this, this certificate. And now we are in the process of uh, uh, um, redesigning this mode based on the evaluation experience that we had with the first version and running it again but it will be after September uh, uh, because of the, uh, of the issues related with the coronavirus. And I know that many people had other priorities, so we postponed a little bit uh, the next version. I keep receiving lots of mails, actually, when we're going to see the next version. It's going to be from, uh, from September. So basically, this MOOC had two, uh, the interesting part is that it has two uh, uh, different uh, types of models. One is the theory, the theory related with educational data, uh, educational data literacy, and the other is actually the practice. And the practical side was, for one week, there was uh, actually a, a practice and uh, inform in, uh, both information, but also practice with um, uh, three e-learning platforms. One was Moodle, which is an open access, and most of the people were familiar with that, and two other uh, preparatory uh, commercial uh, products uh, from European industry, the exact suite, the IMC's learning uh, suite. Uh, of course, these are uh, uh, commercial products, uh, unlike Moodle, which is an open uh, uh, learning management system. And, uh, and there was also a, a, a method for, for evaluating uh, the, the uh, competencies of the educational data competence literacy and uh, leading to a certification of that system. Uh, these are the topics, uh, as you can see, there were uh, eight modules, eight weeks. Uh, first week was the orientation, the last week was the conclusion. And then there were three uh, uh, theory uh, uh, modules, one on uh, online blended teaching and learning support by educational data, one on learning analytics and one on teaching analytics, and then three different uh, modules on applying educational data using specific uh, uh, tools. And I must say, from the feedback that we received from these uh, almost 2,000 people uh, who participated in this MOOC, um, the, the combination of theory and practice was actually the strong uh, uh, point of this MOOC and, the, and the, what uh, kept them uh, active into the process and, and uh, uh, gave them a motive to complete and get the certificate. Uh, we are now working actually um, on a, on a uh, redesign this, and we're working with different uh, ministers of education to probably include this competence profile and also uh, uh, the MOOC uh, in some of the programs, the professional development programs that they propose to the uh, uh, pre-service teachers or the professional development teachers. So there are, we have we have some discussions uh, also outside Europe uh, with organisations. Uh, 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 Ministry of Education who are interested in, in translating, being localized in the local languages uh, uh, in order to 
uh, promote it and use it in, in, in their professional development programs. Uh, one is in uh, uh, South America and another one is in, in Asia. Uh, this is the team uh, who worked on this uh, project. Uh, you can see uh, that we have people from the University of Piraeus, my team, from an origin University of Science and Technology, uh, from the University of Mannheim, Professor Dirk uh, Eaton, and uh, then the three companies that uh, I've mentioned before uh, is uh, Latasio Learning and IMC from Europe, and uh, Innovation, which is representing both the internet. So this is, this is where you can actually get more information about the Learn to Analyze project. And I think that I have now 30 minutes. I managed to, to use the 30 minutes. And uh, I will now stop my presentation. Uh, is that OK? I had 30 minutes, I understand. Is that yes. Right? That's, that's great, Demetrius. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. You did a fabulous job. And uh, thank you for bringing the slides up. And uh, these will be shared on the Eden website. So please, no worries. And we've recorded the session as well. There's a few questions that have come in um, in the question and answer chat. One of them you've answered somewhat in talking about your MOOC, but maybe you could expand upon it a little bit further. This comes from Jacle Cavalia. Uh, what can you say about the digital uh, digital conference to see education competency framework, DigComp Edu, I can't pronounce that right, which Digi. does include some data analytic competencies. Is it not detailed enough, not the right competencies? Uh, and do you think there have been enough attempts to integrate your work with, <clears throat> with their project to avoid yeah. multiplicity? Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. I think that uh, the DigComp Edu uh, competency framework, uh, which is a much more general framework, is not uh, uh, detailed enough. That's that. That's, uh, and, and, and our intention is not to create a, a, a new a competence framework, but to create a subset of a, a competencies related with a focus on educational data literacy, and then plug this in to different existing educational data frameworks like DigiComp Edu, and therefore, with Moodle, who has used the DigiCom and do, we are discussing now to include this framework as part of their program for the assessment and the development of, uh, of the uh, uh, Moodle uh, uh, users uh, 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 framework. And also, we are discussing with people in the United States uh, 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 on the competencies related with instructional designers, because they have more specific, it's only in the US that they have more specific uh, competency frameworks, to actually consider including what we have developed and learned to analyze there as, as a sort of set that extends the, uh, the, the, the instructional designer competencies. That's a very good question. Thank you, Zach. The other one is about uh, educational data literacy part of the teacher's training or future, which is the right place for this kind of training. I think there are two dimensions. One, and, and this is where we actually uh, uh, used it so far. One is to influence the uh, curriculum of uh, schools of education that they prepare uh, uh, students, uh, uh, new graduates uh, uh, on, um, uh, uh, as pre-service teachers. The idea there was that uh, it would be great to have at least one or even more uh, uh, courses uh, that are relevant to educational data literacy because this is something that it's a competence that needs to be included uh, uh, to the competence profile of the graduates of pre-service uh, teachers. So this is relevant to higher education. And um, in Australia, for example, we are discussions with the, with the teacher association because they want to emphasize on this topic, the topic of education and data literacy. And, but it's also relevant to teachers, uh, uh, teachers professional uh, uh, competencies, especially, for example, I know that in the US, um, uh, it is actually part of the requirements for getting your license to demonstrate uh, educational data literacy competence uh, abilities and, uh, uh, in, in, in your exam. So that's, that was a good question too, and I think that this is the reply for that. The other one is in online learning and using an LMS, the learning analytics data are collected automatically by LMS. The question is whether are listed, uh, yeah, analytics, uh, 
what are the emotional data. Okay, so indeed, many data are collected, but I don't think that, that these uh, the systems, they do collect lots of data. I don't think that they have developed uh, so far uh, 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 tools that can analyze this data and uh, 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 to, to the extent that it's actually needed uh, uh, by the uh, different teachers in different uh, contexts. Therefore, th there are lots of interesting uh, dashboards, for example, that you can do related with the engagement mainly of the students, uh, probably also with the performance. But what we need here in the LMS is, is actually tools that can be customized by the uh, individual teachers in a simple way, so each teacher can actually uh, 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 customize his dashboard and, and collect the data and analyze the data which is relevant to its own teaching, and at the same time for the leaders. However, in order to be able to, therefore, what I'm actually saying is that we have reached a, a kind of plateau in terms of, of the software development efforts. And, and the LMS vendors, like Moodle, for example, they want to receive feedback from the people who are using it on what to do next. However, in order to be able to, to, to receive meaningful feedback, it is expected that people have educational data literacy. And that's why I'm saying that this is something that it's a step stone. We need to, to actually uh, do that uh, in order to inform the, 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 uh, the users more about educational data literacy instead of training them through the tools and the functionalities of the tools, train them a little bit beyond these tools so that they can come back and use the tools and provide ideas on, on what else do they need to be able to do from, from these tools. This is, this is what is actually expected from the vendors. And that's why they have invested in being part of the project that I've mentioned, because they want to learn more on the use of these tools and the potential future uh, 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 use. Uh, so, um, there, there, is, uh, there is a question about the MOOC finished uh, 15 of April. Yes, indeed, we extended until 15 of April. Uh, we had a period of time, uh, uh, the question is if there is a, a possibility to follow the self-paced. There was a, a, a period of time for two months until 15 of, of April to have a self-paced uh, mode. Uh, we stopped it in order to create a new version. Uh, um, uh, so we will re we'll probably reopen the, the self pace. We haven't decided yet, but there will be a new version from September anyway, uh, with the opportunity to uh, get a certificate. Um, actually, there was quite an, an interest uh, in, in several parts of the world about the certificate. The other question was uh, about the, what emotional data are. Uh, um, emotional data are the data that we can actually collect through uh, affective computing by having, for example, a camera uh, uh, that can collect face, uh, face uh, expression through face recognition. Uh, there is lots of uh, uh, software uh, uh, from, uh, from uh, industrial partners that they do that. Uh, uh, there are no, not, not that many projects who are actually using this in education. It's, that's why I'm saying that it's an interesting uh, topic for further research, especially under the given circumstances of the large-scale implementation of online uh, education. So there is another question about... Uh, oops. Uh, there are two open questions I see. Could you post the website address for the MOOC? Yes, okay. It's actually on the Learn to Analyze uh, uh, website, and there's a direct link there, so you can get this from, from the slides. And what type of certification is offered for the completion? Uh, it's, not a, it, it's not actually a micro-credential. It's, uh, it's actually a certificate uh, from, uh, from the project uh, under the umbrella of the European Commission for, uh, for uh, completing this course. Uh, we are in discussion with uh, a couple of uh, universities in order to actually have some kind of uh, uh, credentials from the universities, but that's, that's probably a, a discussion that will need to continue a little bit longer because of, uh, of other priorities that they had through the crisis. So I think that uh, I, I answered. So this is, this, is, this is not, we are not yet for the first version of the MOOC on the micro credential uh, side, but we are under discussions for that on the future. So I think that I have replied most of the questions. 
Yes, thank you very much, Demetrius. I appreciate you. you answering the questions and thank you for a wonderful keynote. It was very eye-opening and uh, lots of really, really valuable information there. So I so thank you everyone for listen, for uh, checking in for this first keynote so early in the morning. We're now moving on to our next keynote, who is Denise Whitelock from uh, the Open University of UK. Uh, Professor Denise Whitelock is the interim director for the Institute of Educational Technology at the OU. She's a professor of technology enhanced learning and has over 25 years experience in artificial intelligence for designing, researching, um, and evaluating online and computer-based uh, learning in higher education. She recently led the UK's contribution to the Adaptive Trust e-assessment system for learning, Tesla, and she is currently the editor of Open Learning, the Journal of Open Distance and e-learning. Her work has received international recognition through holding visiting chairs at the Autonoma University Barcelona and the British University in Dubai. Her presentation today is called Digital Assessment and Artificial in Intelligence, Practice and Promise. So very much looking forward to this presentation, um, Denise, and uh, the floor is now yours. Please be sure to share your presentation. Uh, just to be sure, we, for a certain reason, we lost Denise about five minutes ago. I tried to email oh. her or something. Okay. So apologies for this, uh, just to see that it's me around here, not somebody else speaking. So um, I, I don't know, uh, either she lost internet connection or I have no idea what's happening, but she's, I couldn't find her in the attendees anywhere. I'll try to email her because uh, I don't have anything else. Maybe you can carry on with uh, Dimitris to keep speaking as he's still around. Dimitris, please. Yeah, of course. Should yeah, I, I mean find Denise where she is, okay? Absolutely. If there are more questions or anything else that uh, I would, you would like me to elaborate, I would be happy to do that. Okay. So I would be happy to answer any more questions or if Okay. You... Are there any more questions? Would, would anyone like to address a question to Demetrius? Um, one of the questions coming from Paul Prinzel, are there any data that you think that we should not collect? Ah, uh, well, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a very good question. I think that there are <laughs> lots of data that we need to, um, pro probably it's not about not collecting data, it's about um, uh, giving access to the data to certain people, for example, the ownership of the data by the individuals and the, 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 their, their ability to, to uh, decide which data will become visible to whom is actually a very important element, uh, Paul. So um, as far as I'm concerned, I think that all data from that line of thinking, all data should not be collected. <laughs> so, or alternatively, they need to, they can be collected, but it's only the individual user who is the, uh, the one who creates this data who should have the right to release this data and to whom this data will be released and for which used, uh, uh, use uh, will be used. So this is, this is a very important issue. Um, and I think that, Tore, I think this, this, this actually touches the issue of privacy and ethics. I think this is a very important topic uh, uh, and uh, uh, I know that many people in, in our field, because they're coming from the technical side, uh, they're actually not paying too much attention on that. But this is probably the most hot topic, and I know that Tore has done some very uh, excellent work uh, in, the, in this field. Uh, so uh, the other is about uh, assuming students can opt out for emotional data, which, yes, absolutely, yes. Uh, it's the question by Britta. Uh, absolutely, yes. It's the same question, actually, the same, the same thing, the same uh, that the, the data are owned by the, indivi by the individual and, and uh, what will be released and what and how it will be used, it has to be under the control of the individual users. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's completely uh, uh, unethical and, and, and useless, I think. One of the issues, of course, uh, which I would like to comment because I had this discussion here with the Minister of Education is, is uh, the role of the partners, uh, the, of the parents. 
especially when we are actually uh, um, uh, uh, discussing issues re related with recording uh, uh, for uh, for a um, uh, primary school and and for for very young children. Uh, so it's a very complicated topic, and there are no uh, guidelines or works there, and that's why I think that it's another interesting topic for for uh, for um, doing extra work uh, issues related with the, the sensitivity of the data, especially when it comes to such young ages. The other is what can you say about Moodle's analytics frame, particularly about predicting which. Well, I'm not. I'm. I'm. am not in favor of any of the tools of, uh, that. I mean, I'm not. I'm not very happy with any of the tools that I have seen in in all uh, course management systems. I think that they have uh, very simplistic prediction algorithms um, uh, most of the times, and, uh, and and that's why I'm saying that this is probably uh, 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 the, the the start of uh, 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 that they have done the LMSs, but, but probably uh, uh, more work can be done only if users are engaged in the process and they start defining their needs in a more accurate way. So I think that the vendors have done what they can do and the software developers and the, and the, and the researchers and everybody, but at the end of the day, now it's a time for, for people to use it in a large scale and learn from, from, from that. Um, yeah, Dimitrius, I think this is also something that uh, that Martin brought up in his keynote. Yeah, just the real need for more social media, more interaction too, uh, amongst the educators and in, in sharing their best practices. So Moodle is trying to do what they can do, but but as you pointed out, is not something that uh, is really in their domain. Yeah. So moving on to the next question, could you show some examples of visual visualization of useful data? Before that, I would probably like to comment on, on what you said, Lisa. That, uh, okay. That's why we insisted on the teaching analytics part, because um, it, it, it's actually quite useful to for people to understand that that, uh, uh, um, that there is a design behind teaching and learning, okay? And there is effect uh, in, in, uh, from the delivery of our design. Uh, uh, and therefore, using the data in order to analyze our teaching and reflect on, on our practice is, of course, it's common sense for all of us here, but it's probably not very common sense for the hoi polloi, for the, for the mass of the teachers who are working uh, in the field. And therefore, the teaching analytics tools are probably a, 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 a useful to have. That's why I highlighted this part of the educational data analytics tools. But I think we have our next speaker. Uh, yes, we have. Unfortunately, she lost internet connection and she's okay. now from her phone. So, so welcome, okay. Denise. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I'll, I'll stop here and give the floor to, to the next speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, okay. everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. Can you see me? Yes, we can see you, Denise. I want to share my screen. There's a button at the very bottom. Yeah. Can just you click see on it? that? Yeah, um, just click on the, but the arrow pointing up. I just want to get this. Let me get this up. Can you see my screen now? Not yet. I've clicked on it and I need to, you can't seem to see my screen. No, there is another share blue button at in the right corner of the screen, which comes up after you select uh, what you want to. Yeah, that's what. Yes. Got it. Oh, thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So. Yeah. Good morning, great everyone. Social. It's a great pleasure to be with you this morning. I'm so sorry I'm late. My internet went down. Um, I, we're all suffering this in this new COVID-19 situation. Now, I'm Denise Whitelock. I'm from the, I'm the director at the moment of the Institute of Educational Technology at the Open University in the UK. And we have 170,000 students. And this is my building. And the IET, the Institute of Educational Technology, was one of the first um, departments in this new way of working, this new university. I've been working in AI for a, a long time now, and I want to talk to you today about some of my own work and others' work and about in digital assessment. And 
how I want to take the student's point of view, the teacher's point of view, researchers, awarding bodies, software developers and disruptors. So this is how I'm going to run the, the presentation this morning. I think it's very important when we're talking about assessment to think about the students and their feelings. And this is some work from Chris McKillop, a doctoral student who wanted students to write narrative stories about their feelings about assessment. She didn't get very far, but when she asked them to draw, this is what she found. And here's another um, picture from her collection. And, you know, assessment is very um, stressful for students and we need to bear that in mind. And of course, what happens to us in our um, teaching? I would say if I asked you and I was in the room, I wish I was with you all. Um, I asked you, you know, what's your way of working and your teaching? You'd probably say you were all constructivists. And so we're moving pedagogy forward. But also we, we, we work within institutions that are awarding bodies from the institution. But in all this um, AI work, learning analytics work that we heard from our colleague earlier, I think the grand challenge for all of us is representing in some way an analysis of learning that can be readily understood by ourselves, the teachers, and also the students. Now, here's an example of Ali Fowler's work. She used a, a LISC program. This is early AI stuff. And what she was doing is um, there was a call from the teachers who were teaching Spanish in an English university. And they had many thousands of students and they couldn't um, have enough tutors to respond to the students quickly enough. And you know, I'm speaking to you, I'm a native speaker in English. I'm sure a lot of you are not uh, native speakers and you've learned English. And it's very difficult if you make a mistake or you start making mistakes and they're not corrected early, then you get this fossilization. So what she did is she set up this program where students could um, start translating and they had two attempts. If you can see on the slide, attempt one, they got 57%. They got some feedback and then they tried again. And so this is an early AI program, but what's important, there are lessons important here for us even now. So if you want to give some feedback during a test, that it is best if there are two attempts to unequally weight the marks and to give more weight to the first attempt. Otherwise, the students won't try hard enough. And they found that. And so the, the final mark really depends on how much help and support has been given. And so therefore, you know, it opens um, the agenda to um, people that you can give feedback during a test and change the marks accordingly. And as I mentioned earlier, students have a lot of anxiety about testing and how do we maintain our empathy with the learner? And to give feedback that I've been writing about, which I call advice for action. And goodness, look, somebody's tried to write all their answers on their picture, um, on their hand, because they're so nervous and look at the expression of anxiety. So how can we help students with their feedback, reduce their anxiety and motivate them? And I was given a task at the university to try and write some, a program, and I did this with Stuart Watt, um, so that students in the arts faculty didn't want just multiple choice questions, but they wanted to write something in, in some text, this was early days, and get some feedback. And before I started doing this work, I was very impressed by the work of Carol Dweck. And her work, I'd like to share that with you, where she realized 
and her research that praise often means to a student that they're clever. Another negative feedback often means that I haven't got any ability, I can't change and I can't do very well. And Dweck did this particular work in the United States with Muller. They, they looked at thousands and thousands, worked with thousands and thousands of school children in the US and gave them uh, Raven's uh, tests. These are um, non-verbal reasoning tests and they set up three tests with the students and it was a randomized controlled trials. So some of the students were praised for effort, some for ability. They took a second test and then the third test. And what was important here is that the students who were praised for effort scored one point more than those for ability. So what does this work tell us? And what does, is Dweck telling us? She's saying your intelligence is something very basic with people um, and people when they receive feedback can believe that their intelligence is very fixed and it doesn't matter what they do. And if you have a growth mindset, you actually believe that you can try. A lot of uh, work is trial and, and error and that you can change and you can get better. And what does a fixed mindset look like in people that you're working with? Often they're very super sensitive about being wrong and they're always trying to prove themselves. Whereas with a growth mindset, people are more willing to stretch themselves, confront obstacles um, that become challenges and there's a lack of tension when learning. So how could we promote this growth mindset and start praising for effort? And this is what we did in a program called Open Comment. And we worked with the history department. And here you see an example of a question in history. We um, often ask, um, we're, we're always usually teaching about the First World War. And here, I put in, uh, they asked a question, I put in the answer, no idea, and then I got some feedback. But what I want to share with you now is what's underneath the program and how I tried to organize it. Because what I had to do is I had to work as a history student and work with the, the uh, professor and try and understand his feedback and to build a system. So what we did is the first phase, the program looks at your, your, your um, input and tries to detect errors. But more importantly, we took on board Dweck's work and you can see underneath here, there will be something re uh, response to you as a student. You've done well to start answering this question, but perhaps you must you misunderstood it. Instead of thinking about X, consider Y. And the next part of the, the program, it starts to look at omissions, things that you've left out. You might have left something out and we'll give you feedback about that. But always praising what's correct to point out what's missing, showing the effort. And then in the final stages of the analysis, we'd look for clarification, um, inferencing, and often when you mark the work yourself, you know, students present the facts, but they don't tell you why, what is the inference, what reasoning sh message should you take from what they told you. Now, obviously, um, you know, our systems aren't that clever, and um, we had to check we only had questions that included causality because we could manage the programming in that way. And in the final stage, we asked, um, we looked to see whether causal factors weighted. Now, you might think that's a bit of a strange thing, especially if you're a scientist, that this would be what would be happening in a history essay. And the... Um, What's, what's surprising to me 
was that when I started to answer the questions and the essays the students did myself, I could only get a C grade. And then I found out what, how I could get an A grade. And that was because I was talking about the causes of the First World War, but I wasn't weighting the factors. I wasn't saying which cause was more important than another. And once the students understand that, they can do very well. So we set about, and I showed you um, at the beginning, those diagrams that the students had written and, and drawn to show their emotional difficulties with assessment. And it's very important to think about how can I support the students with the written feedback. So what we did was we looked at the feedback tutors had given in the um, open university on the uh, assignments. And I thought, how can I code those comments? It's very difficult to set up a coding system. It takes years. And I found Bale's coding system. Bale's was a um, psychologist in the 50s. And he built this system to look at um, group interaction. And what he found is that in any group that works very well, you need a cognitive leader and you also need someone to provide socio-motive support. And that could, could be in the same person. But if you look here, there are four groups of categories. A being at the top of the screen, you'll see positive reactions. At the bottom D, they are the negative reactions. B are the attempted answers, which if you look at them closely, are things that we do when we're teaching. And there's also a set of questioning. What I did was analyze thousands and thousands of scripts with the feedback. And this is one particular um, course at the Open University. If you look at this chart, you will see on the left-hand side, the A, B, C, and D categories that we saw before, representing those that are in the Bales group. And then you'll see pass one, two, three, and four. Pass one is the highest pass given to that assignment. Now let's look at just the bars for the A group, the praise. You'll see there's more praise for passes one and two, the highest um, uh, marks given and less praise for the lower marks. That is not unreasonable. If you look at the teaching comments, you'll find that there are more teaching comments given by the tutors in the lower grades, the lower passes, three and four, less in the higher passes. And again, this is very reasonable if you think about it, because if the student has a lower mark, the tutor has to give them more feedback to help them get better. Let's move to the group C. I believed that the students who got the past one, the best marks, should have received more questions from the tutors, encouraging them, asking them, pushing them to do better and to explore different areas. In fact, I was completely wrong there. And that was due to the English language. What we do and what tutors tend to say to their students, if they haven't included something, have you thought about including X? In other words, being very polite, instead of saying, this is something you should have included. And so that was the change, the unexpected result here. But more importantly, I think, look at the D group and we train our tutors. Obviously, we don't see our students. They don't see us only in certain tutorials. We don't see them day by day. And there is less negativity, which we were very pleased about. We would be very worried because we do train our tutors to, to give feedback. So with bearing that in mind, we built this system called Open Mentor. 
It strips out all the tutor comments that are typed in to the assignment and it classifies them. And you can see examples here. But more importantly, from that last um, uh, analysis here, we built an algorithm so that for the mark awarded, we could um, have an algorithm that would tell you what the number of comments you should see from the tutor. And so here, this is an assignment that's been put in, assignment for Sandy Smith. Of course, this is a, um, a, a made up name. This isn't the, the uh, student's real name, but they were given 61 marks, mark assigned 61. And if you look at the bar chart below, you'll see for group A, that's the praise, the comments of praise, that the uh, tutor gave a certain number that are in blue, that's a blue block, and the ideal number from the algorithm. So they were less, they gave less praise than you'd expect for this uh, mark. They gave less teaching comments, i.e. category B, and less um, questioning and more negative comments. So the tutor could see how they were marking and how they were giving feedback. We were not there to um, give feedback about the marking, but about the feedback itself to help the student do better. So this is a um, program that was developed and then obtained GIST money and has been used not only in the OU for training our tutors, but also in Southampton University and King's College London. I'd like to move on to some other work, which I think is more, much more important now to think about in the times of COVID, where this was work funded um, but in the UK, also with um, Oxford University. And the problem that I tried to solve here was that, um, as you know, in distance universities, we have an open university. You don't have to have qualifications to come. Students might not have written essays for years and they don't get support writing that first essay, their first assessment. And I started to work and I wanted to work with Stephen Pullman from Oxford because he was an expert at summarization. And the reason I wanted to work with someone with that capacity is because if I understand what you've told me, I can actually say it back to you. And that was a theoretical stance I wanted to take as um, from the work of Gordon Pask, conversation theory, which I'd studied when I was a doctoral student. So we built a system that summarized the students' essays and it actually looked at the structure, the key words and key phrases and key sentences. We were using natural language processing. And here we can see um, how the uh, feedback is given to the student. There are hints. It uh, splits up the essay into introduction, evidence and conclusions. It does different types of analysis and gives you different types of graphics. One of the most important um, and valuable uh, feedback that part of this that the students found valuable was this keyword dispersion graph. And here you can see the words that are used in the introduction of an essay and in the conclusion. And that we know with a very good essay, an essay is a story with evidence. So it tells you in the introduction what it's going to talk about. And then it explains what all that meant in the conclusion. And if the introduction and conclusions don't match to some extent, then the essay is not working well. 
So this was used, we use this with our MAODE students or master's students in open and distance education. They had to use um, the uh, open essayist for essay one and essay two. We found there were significant um, differences to their marks from using this system. And the mean grade for the overall module was um, uh, higher with students who'd used this than the year before, with significant differences. But I'd now like to show you something that we didn't um, uh, trial with this particular group, but we built a bit later. And if you look here, I've shown you some text, just a very small amount of text. You can see that there are some sentences in color. And I'm gonna show you how that text moves itself into a sentence graph. And it shows you with the different colors, the different parts of the um, uh, little piece of text, how connected those sentences are together. And from this, we built the rainbow diagrams. The um, red nodes are the conclusions, the violet nodes are the introductions. Let me show you. If you put in 10 identical paragraphs, you get a pattern that looks like this. Now, if you have 50 identical sentences, you've got more of a globe representation. But then we put in from Stanford University, one of their prize booth essays. Now look, now you can see that the whole of the phrases and sentences are very well connected. The introduction, the violet, um, notes and the red notes are very close together and the rest of the essay, which is the evidence of that essay, are very well connected. So we put in this essay from the one of our students with a high grade, obviously not as good as the um, uh, Stanford Booth essay, but we can see the connectedness and we can see that there are parts of the story not well connected, they are on the periphery. And here's a low grade where we can see less connectedness. What we did then was we actually um, put, we asked students, 45 students to write two essays. And we put them through the rainbow diagrams and we found that we could um, by eye um, look at these but we found that the differences, um, that essays rated as high by the rainbow diagrams would be expected to receive 8.56 percentage points more than essays rated as medium and 17.2 percentage points higher than essays rated from rainbow diagrams as low. A very important finding and um, We've been using this with uh, our students in helping them to write essays, giving them feedback, formative feedback, to improve um, the connectedness of their arguments. I want to talk about now just one final example of work just recently, a European project I was involved with. And I think, again, very important in this COVID time because it was about um, trust, adaptive trust e-assessment, and it was about securing reliable online assessment using a range of technologies, voice and face recognition, keystroke pattern detection. As you know, we all have our own um, way of typing that can be um, detected. And there was anti-plagiarism and forensic analysis in this raft of technologies all put into one system. And um, there were uh, many partners in this project, but these are the partners who actually tested the systems. And we've looked at thousands and thousands of students testing these systems throughout Europe. And the subject areas we looked at, a good range of subject areas in the arts and uh, sciences, 
uh, social and legal sciences, health sciences, engineering and architecture. And we ran three pilots. And you can see the um, types of assessments that we put through from these different areas. And the language of the courses, it wasn't just in English. So we had Turkish, Finnish, um, ourselves at the OU in, in the UK, Dutch partners, Spanish partners, Bulgarians as well, trialing the system. And we used a range of activities, online essay writing, short answer quizzes, planning, there was coursework, reading, reviewing, all sorts of different assessments. And on the whole, there was a very positive experience. Um, but there were real challenges about people giving away their facial rec recognition, you know, their, their pictures of themselves and their audio. And, but we were GDPR compliant the way the system was. But, you know, giving away personal data, you know, is a difficult thing to do when we're not, uh, we're not always ready to do that. But the most important finding, I think, was that the students recognised that we would be moving, although this is pre-COVID, just before, you know, last year, that we would be moving more and more into e-assessments, you know, final exams being carried out in this way. And that they felt that, you know, students should not be able to plagiarise other students because that would make a difference to their results and that their institution needed to be trusted by employers that if they were um, undertaking this type of assessment, that everything was proctored and invigilated correctly. I finally, I'd like to talk about disruptors, disruptors in, in our area. Of course, there are commercial companies who are bringing AI into the market. There are private online learning institutions. So there will be different ways, bringing new ways of working and government policies. Um, governments want shorter, cheaper courses. We're talking about micro credentials at the moment. And of course, COVID-19 will be a major disruptor when people have had to move online when they're not used to moving online. And of course, um, in this picture here, you can see now he's a little robot we've got in our lab at the computer science department, which I've been working with. And we've got already got chatbot recommender systems and they are becoming better. We are um, linking some of our feedback with Alexa so that you can um, query um, uh, our systems, our courses, and we can direct you to um, a point in the text that you want to learn about, you want to know about. And um, how about language rehearsal with your own robot who won't be tired, who will listen continuously? Um, maybe we're not at this phase next, but um, I can uh, take questions, but it won't be three million in five minutes. Thank you for your attention. And I've left you with some references um, uh, and I'm sure my slides will be um, uh, distributed. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Denise. We really appreciated you coming in and, uh, and also with the technical challenges that you faced uh, that we were able to overcome those. There are a couple of questions in the chat box that um, perhaps uh, I will direct to you. One of them is uh, many schools in Europe still have graduation exams when school students are tested after 10 to 12 years of school learning. And the exams, which are very stressful, uh, decide their future learning and careers. We have a situation like that also in Germany. Uh, sometimes they, ca they cannot have the second chance even after a decade. School gradu graduation is engraved in their life and by, uh, determined by their diploma. How would you comment on these practices and what would you recommend for the policymakers in education in these countries? Um, 
let's think about what the policymakers want. We want a well-educated um, workforce that is confident and people don't always do well at school. And you've, you heard me talk about Dweck's work mm -hmm. and they don't feel that they, they don't feel they are good learners and they can learn and improve. So we have to look at ourselves and how we teach, how we give feedback and also the sorts of tasks we give our students. We need to, uh, the uh, Tesla project helped us think about new ways of testing, new types of tests, where we, people can shine, show their ability, because some people are very nervous under um, terrible, these test conditions. I myself was immensely nervous. I was with you for 24 minutes. My internet went down. I had to ring someone who looks after our internet in our house, and they said, we can't fix it. We turn off the routers and nothing. You must go to your internet provider. So it was absolutely terrible, but I had to overcome it. And I couldn't even see your faces when I was talking. So was that a good test? Well, I managed to pass it, I think, somehow. But for somebody else, that might have really shaken them, especially they've been a younger researcher. So why don't we think about the range of tests that we want to give our students? They shouldn't all be the same and they should be given at different times and um, to show and to try and bring confident students to the end of their studies where they know it is not just ability that if you do a thesis, you know it's 10% inspiration, 90% perspiration. And it's the people who have, who continue and keep going that come out in the end. Thank you. Very good point about the growth mindset. It's, it's really important. And perhaps we need to start teaching our policymakers a little bit more about the importance of the growth mindset within our curriculum. Yeah. Uh, I have another question from Raza Greenspawn, and that is, hello, Denise, I've been analyzing the concepts of assessment for learning informative assessment, and I found that some scholars think that they are synonymous, while other researchers argue that and list certain criteria in which these assessment strategies differ. What view do you support, and how is formative assessment different from assessment for learning? Thank you. Um, for me, formative assessment isn't any different for an assessment for learning. That's what it should be. And that's why the type of feedback is so important. And I showed you Open Mentor, where we were trying to help tutors to give very good feedback. And for me, I've been writing about what I call advice for action. So that feedback must help you move forward, help you change and practice. Mm. Maybe what I'm really concerned about is that students don't have time to practice too much something they've just learned. We wouldn't go and take a driving test after a couple of lessons. We would make sure, and our instructor would make sure that we were safe on the road. And I've had students uh, say to me sometimes, if only I knew the questions you were going to ask me before, even in a class setting, I would look cleverer, you know, I'd look better. And um, I think, you know, assessment for learning is formative assessment so you can practice and you should be able to practice. And like that essay, open essayist, you could practice. And what we found was that when they had that tool, Students didn't give in um, their, their last minute attempt. They did practice using the tool. Now you could say the tool isn't that smart. Well, it isn't. Maybe it was the practice, but does it matter? Because you need to practice, you need feedback, and you need confidence to be able to ask someone to give you who you trust to give you some feedback. 
Uh, I have a question, um, and this is based on my experience working with uh, educators who have really large numbers of students in their classrooms. How can we promote that growth mindset within classrooms that have these super high student enrollments, for example, at the University of South Africa? I mean, how can we promote, what, what can our- This, can is, our this is where I think AI's got a big, big role. And I showed you some of, as I've been working in AI over a number of years, because what we need to be moving to is personalized feedback. And we can do that with AI techniques. Um, it's not perfect, we're getting there. Um, our previous speaker talked about the learning analytics, predictive analytics, we use this ourselves at the OU, but then what are the measures, the pedagogical um, interventions that can take place? But um, that's a move towards, but also um, what we can do more simply is, for example, we've got a lot of people here today with a lot of chat going on. Right, and in MOOCs and in Future Learn, our micro credentials. How can a tutor with thousands of these chats respond? So the um, open essayist can actually um, analyze all that feedback and summarize. So they can summarize where we are in the chat and how you can respond to that. So the main issue that the students are having trouble with is this. But Ideally, we all want a personalized tutor. Yes. Um, the next question I have is from uh, Katrina, Katriona Niche, and her question is, are the systems you, dis you developed, are they available for other institutions to build in their feedback and assessment? And are any of the assessment systems, yeah, this is the same question, the assessment um, systems available the, uh, for Open Essayist is in GitHub, it's open source. So you can go to GitHub, um, open uh, mentor. Um, you can contact me and I can see if I can give you a, some, you know, a, a time to use it. And um, Tesla, um, the, that system, you go to the website. We have a package there um, where you can have part of the system and you can use it. So, um, and I think all, um, I know in the UK, if you have any funding now, it must be open source. Okay, thank you very much, Denise. Uh, are there any additional questions? We have a couple of minutes if anyone would like to ask an additional question. If not, we'll move on to our next speaker. Okay, well, thank you again, Denise. It was a very uh, informative uh, presentation and it's great to see the research that you're doing. And I'm very happy you were able to overcome the technological challenges this morning. Thank you, Lisa Marie. Thank so you. our third speaker today is Anthony Camilleri, who is the director of the Knowledge Innovation Center in Malta. Uh, Anthony's expertise is in quality assurance processes and knowledge transfer of research. He's given training on techniques for peer review to quality assurance agencies across Europe. For knowledge transfer, he has worked with international associations to better describe their research outcomes uh, through their communication channels. He's also developed a methodology for improving impact measurement of dissemination and exploitation activities within EU projects. Anthony was previously engaged as quality services manager for the European Foundation for Quality in e-learning, FQL responsible for coordination of projects linked to OER, including OER test and VM pass. Um, and he's going to be talking to us today about the introduction to the micro HE project final conference micro credentials in the future European policy landscape. So Anthony, the floor is now yours. Thank you. I just do a quick audio test, make sure you can hear me fine. I see you nodding. So uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, so uh, being that I am introducing a session, I thought it would be useful to contextualize the discussion we're having on micro-credentials. Uh, all of a sudden, this seems to be one of those crazes in education that uh, is on everybody's lips. 
And if we're going to talk about contextualizing any European uh, policy initiative at the moment, it is important to recognize the context in which we are operating. Uh, namely, and simply, this spring the world changed. I don't think I have had a conversation in the past four months that didn't uh, have a reference to COVID or to Corona. Suddenly, all of us have become data analytics experts looking at the latest numbers. And higher education in particular has been called upon to go above and beyond doing everything from providing distance learning to masses of students overnight, to research arms being asked to produce vaccines, to all kinds of innovations and things which we thought wouldn't even be possible two or three months ago. And if you were to characterize this as an expression, you might say that higher education is operating in a world changed utterly. And hopefully those of you who are more perceptive will have noticed that there's a small problem with this article, and that is that it's dated 2010. Because as a matter of fact, the last time we were saying higher education has to face new challenges and be more flexible and rise to the challenge and be more employable, and you're all familiar with the set of trends, was the last time a financial crisis hit in 2008. And part of the response at that time was the famous or infamous year of the MOOC, which was famously declared by the New York Times in 2012. And if you bought in to uh, all the hype that was around that, MOOCs were supposed to give a student choice. They were supposed to uh, allow for increased employability. They were uh, supposed to allow for reskilling. And the more you read into it, it was supposed to be part of the solution to the dark times we were living in and to the reduced opportunity of people in that crisis. And when we're talking about this, it is good to keep in mind the perspective of what we might call millennials. And simply enough, if you're from my generation, which I just barely qualify as a millennial, we are now facing the second once in a lifetime economic crash in the period of 10 years. And if we look at the results, the last economic crisis, you find that people are actually less well off than earlier generations. They have lower earnings, fewer assets, less wealth, fewer children, fewer marriages. It has had a real concrete effect. And that was the result of the one in 2008. Now we're coming up to the second one, and these people are going to get hit a second time. So it would be worth asking, do we as an educational establishment have a good answer, a good value proposition for them? And if we look around at the things that are being uh, uh, posted, we find that MOOCs again are being touted as part of the answer and that people are showing increased numbers in MOOCs. So these are just some class central rankings for MOOCs. And basically what you're seeing is that in uh, March and April, the numbers of sessions on all the large MOOC platforms increased uh, dramatically, everything from 50% all the way up to 400% in terms of increased hits. So my question over here would be, are we quoting Peter Pan saying that all this has happened before and will happen again? Are we just repackaging solutions from 2010 for the modern crisis out of a dearth of better ideas? Or are micro-credentials something fundamentally different and something fundamentally new that will have a difference on education systems. And before I jump into this, one thing which I would ask you to consider is one of the MOOCs 
that was launched in the past six months, which was a MOOC on COVID-19 offered by Imperial College London. The first version of this had 70,000 users. It's being re-offered. And at the moment, it has something in the region of 130,000 people subscribed. It is a 13-hour MOOC. And I ask you to consider, where else in the history of higher education have we been able to run in a matter of weeks, deploy it globally, and have 200,000 people listen directly from the experts in the field in response to a public health emergency? This was not even technologically possible 10 years ago. And the fact that now, let's say, we can produce this with this kind of speed and this kind of accuracy says something about how the uh, MOOC and the short learning program industry have grown up over the years. So my question is, are micro-credentials just rebranded MOOCs? Or are micro-credentials the crooks of 30 years of educational innovation? And to consider that, we need to jump into what we consider micro-credentials to be. And the, one of the fun things about micro-credentials is that nobody really agrees on a definition. So depending on who you ask, micro-credentials can be anything from open badges to very, very formalized higher education units of about five to 10 ECTS to private learning programs. So there are a lot of definitions out there. And if we're going to talk about a European landscape of micro-credentials, we really need to settle on one of these. But the one thing everybody seems to agree on is that a core element of micro-credentials is that it's made up of a system of interoperable building blocks. And this concept of interoperability and of combining different micro-credentials with each other is the core difference between micro-credentials and what came before. Um, to some extent, you might say that micro-credentials represent a more mature vision of education than MOOCs. Or you might rephrase that and say it rep they represent a less libertarian vision of open education than MOOCs. And what we mean by here, this is just putting content out there, and hoping that people will find it and that people will put together personalized and that those personalized learning pathways will miraculously become recognized without much intervention um, is very, very idealistic, but not necessarily the way the world works. On the other hand, taking that same, that same set of open education modules, that same set of opportunities, and creating pathways in which they can be combined and creating structures that allow for that combination can become much, much more powerful and be a bridge between, let's say, the very, very open ideals of open education and the much, much more formalized ivory tower arguments you are used to hearing. So in a way, micro-credentials are trying to occupy this middle ground between the two. And linked to that, micro-credentials can be said to have five features. The five features generally are considered to be modularity, which means that micro-credentials can be uh, grouped into small units. Stackability, which means that they can be combined and that smaller credentials can be combined to make up larger credentials. Portability, which means that you should be able to take micro-credentials earned at one institution and use them in another institution. Um, digital, and here we mean that the credentials themselves are digital. And universality, which means that those micro-credentials should be available in different educational contexts and different educational The other unique thing about micro-credentials 
is that if we think about our educational life cycle, curriculum course specifications are set by educational institutions and they are the input which goes into a course. Courses and programs are taught by the educational institutions and the combinations within courses and programs are also controlled by institutions. Credentials are the output that comes after you have finished your learning. And credentials are held by the student and are controlled by the student. And when we talk within the sphere of micro-credentials of stacking and combining, we think of the student being the one who is the final say and the final control about how to combine these into portfolios. So the focus on learners is also one of the key features when we talk about it. And so what I would ask you to consider is how are micro-credentials like electric cars? And if you think how are micro-credentials like electric cars, I would argue that if my PowerPoint will work, the concept has been proven. So MOOCs and short learning programs and also non-technology tech non-e-learning short programs such as summer schools have been proven as a concept. They are known to work. The technology behind them, the technology that powers them has also been proven. We are able to easily broadcast courses to tens of thousands of students without too much trouble. There's a clear social imperative for flexibilizing education. There's public demand for these courses, as shown by the statistics I was showing you before of increasing MOOC numbers. We've also proven that uh, the micro-credentials aren't necessarily the ambit of new exotic providers only. We've proven that legacy providers are able to uh, provide micro-credentials and they are relatively easy to get. You can go online and find a whole ecosystem of micro-credentials. And finally, they enable new types of educational mobility. So how else are micro-credentials like electric cars? They also share some of the same problems in that they're not accepted everywhere. They're not fully trusted. They're not always interoperable and they face issues around scaling. Also, they compete with legacy systems of let's say more traditional forms of degrees. And if we are to actually help micro-credentials reach their potential, we have to figure out how to address these challenges at a policy level. And to, to do this, we first need to understand the prevalence of micro-credentials and if this is something that institutions are actually interested in. And the answer to this, a quick news, a quick uh, scan on news sources. This is just a few selections. The European MOOC Consortium launching a common micro-credential framework made up of some of the largest MOOC providers. This one is from yesterday, the Australian government building a $4.3 million online micro-credentials marketplace. The European Commission getting in on the act and putting a, uh, together a consultation group on micro-credentials in higher education. So we see that there are a lot of actors which are putting their heads together and trying to address some of the issues around it. So a quick, and the reason this is a hard problem is because of the scale. So just playing around with some numbers, let's assume that micro-credentials become widespread tomorrow. And let's assume that we have a thousand universities or educational institutions offering 50 courses per institution. That would mean that we would have a European market of 50,000 micro-credentials. And if we assume that we are gonna combine those into five credential packages, that gives us two sextillion possible combinations. That is an uh, order of magnitude of complexity above what we are used to in education. And the essential question is how do we move 
from a higher education system that is used to dealing with a limited number of known quantities in the forms of degrees and qualifications. How does that system start dealing with these kinds of numbers around micro-credentials? And to bake the problem down a little more, it brings adoption challenges for students because in that sea of credentials, how do I as a student find the quality resources that will help me and help my career? From a higher education institution perspective, how do I recognize the credentials from other institutions and systems that might not be exactly like my own? And from an employer's perspective, how on earth do I assess the CVs of students coming in with all these micro-credentials, each of them with a personalized learning profile? How do I find the time to actually go through these and understand what each student has learned? So micro-credentials offer some very, very real challenges, which are not necessarily straightforward to address. Um, helping us, though, we do have a whole bunch of drivers of adoption. Um, first of all, open source technologies, open source standards on how to describe education, on how to, uh, on how to secure credentials, uh, on how to share information between student information management systems. All of these are things that help us deal with large volumes of data in education. If we want to get fancy, there are also emerging technologies such as AI, such as blockchain, that can help make these things even easier. We're seeing the emergence of common European standards, everything from the Europass standards to the ELMO standards to uh, IEEE standards to ISO standards, who are all looking into how can we standardize the data that is in educational credentials. We're also seeing the beginning of national strategies for qualifications, national strategies for micro-credentials being offered in some countries. And we're seeing the beginning of some noise around micro-credentials in the Bologna process and some indications that the topic might be taken up there. So we do have a lot of technology and education policy activities coming together to try and address this field. The question I would ask you then is, what is the to-do list for European policy in this area? And I would propose that there are some straightforward items that need to be dealt with if micro-credentials are to reach their true potential. The first and simplest is that we need a common definition of micro-credentials. It's high up on the agenda of most of the groups that are looking around this, but at the moment, micro-credentials are widely defined as anything less than a degree. Uh, and the current definition is not necessarily useful. A common definition is important because a common definition allows you to describe a unit which can be traded, a unit that can be described. And once we have that common uh, definition, the second thing we need to do is standardize module structure and descriptions. What we mean by this is that we need some kind of credit system, some kind of trading system that allows us to actually put these, these micro-credentials together, that allows us to carry them for some, that allows us to measure the learning a person has actually done in what areas. And since education isn't something that can be measured like currency, we also need standardized descriptions to go along with those module structures. The importance of standardization here, again, I remind you about that slide with the sextillion on it. Without standardized module structures and standardized descriptions, there is too much information for us to be able to rationally process, for us to be able to understand. Step three, is integrating them into qualification frameworks. So in every country in Europe or nearly every country in Europe, we have qualification frameworks that define essentially what 
can be learned by students. At the moment, in most countries, there are certain exceptions, such as Ireland, that already have micro-credentials. But in most countries, the menu of what can be learned stops at things which are at least a year long. So if we want to promote micro-credentials, we need some recognition in the legislative and policy frameworks that there are smaller units of learning that might be useful to learners. And step four, we need to define quality standards that cover these. Within higher education, this is an easier problem. We already have a quality assurance system that can be easily extended to cover micro-credentials. But if we think about a definition of micro-credentials that incorporates different forms of open learning, that incorporates continuing professional education, that incorporates various forms of adult learning that even might uh, consist of courses offered by NGOs, we need a way to understand quality across all of these different perspectives. And we need a way for the quality systems that apply to these different areas of education to be able to communicate and to understand each other. And step five, once we've defined all these standards, we need to define information and data models. And the reason for this is that the only way we are ever going to be able to sensibly process the levels of information we are taught that will be generated by micro-credentials, whether it be a student searching for a course or an employer processing CVs, will be with the assistance of machines. We will need a computer-aided, a technology-enhanced approach. And the basis of any technological approach is information and data models. And finally, we need to incentivize institutional networks for micro-credential mobility. And what we mean by this is that once we have all the policy infrastructures in place, no amount of uh, descriptions and recognition policies are going to actually make institutions accept micro-credentials. Institutions will accept micro-credentials between them when they are working as networks, when they are signing cross-recognition agreements, and when they are using the entire infrastructure of recognition that exists in Europe for trusting the quality and examining the equivalence of uh, credits that come from other institutions. Alongside of this, we can also examine and test new technologies. And we hear a lot about uh, the potentials of blockchain. We hear a lot about the potentials of AI. They do all have a lot of potential, but probably none of them can be considered a panacea as of yet without testing. So if we go through these seven uh, steps, we have an idea of where micro of what needs to happen on micro credentials. What can possibly stop us from actually achieving what seems like seven quite straightforward activities that need to be done in the policy environment. And the first tension is what we might call ivory towers and walled gardens. Ivory towers are usually associated with higher education and it's usually associated with higher education not being open to the wider world. So one of the big mistakes we can do is say that micro-credentials are a creature of higher education, that micro-credentials are broadly equivalent to ECTS, and that micro-credential policy is basically about institutions sharing ECTS more freely amongst themselves. While that definitely should be part of a micro-credential policy, it leaves out all the rest of the education ecosystem and it leaves out most of the more interesting combinations of why students might want to follow these creatures. The second part of this is and walled gardens are essentially private providers or sometimes public providers but mainly private providers saying we are going to create a micro-credential ecosystem but this is only available to on our platform through our subscription. And essentially, when you lose access to our platform, you also lose access to all the, that learning and possibly even to your achievements. So walled gardens 
or ivory towers go against the idea of openness and choice that micro-credentials are supposed to represent. Second tension and barrier is the eternal discussion of harmonization versus standardization. It's very, very easy for us to say standardization is hard, so let's harmonize instead. And I do understand the reasons you want to harmonize. But simply enough, the more you opt for harmonization versus standardization, the more complexity you introduce into the system. Because we're talking about a system that's already vastly complex and has vast variety in it, the more harmonization we increase, the harder we make for all of this to be transferred. So in the harmonization versus standardization debate, it's dangerous to go for the easy answer of harmonization unless it's absolutely necessary. Third challenge is what I call AI optimism. Uh, I hear it a lot in meetings these days where they say, okay, there's no problem. Uh, how do we help students? How do we help students choose the right them, we'll throw AI at that problem. Uh, how do we figure out which CVs are most appropriate? If we have a vast CVs, we'll throw AI at that problem. Um, how do we uh, how do we assure the quality of credentials? We'll throw AI at that problem. And no doubt, we can do a lot with AI. We can do a lot with natural language processing, but AI is. A, in its infancy, makes a lot of mistakes, and B, AI sets. And if you think about how many high quality data sets there are on student choice and micro-credentials, there aren't really any yet. Maybe we can start thinking about it and start thinking how we can build data sets that will allow us to process micro-credentials in the future. And AI will definitely be part of as strategy on a longer, let's say, 10-year perspective. But at the moment, I would argue that AI isn't there. We need slightly more traditional approaches and not just saying AI will solve this eventually. Um, last part of this is incumbent momentum. And just like I made, I said that, listen, there's a lot similar to electric cars and the challenges that are faced by micro-credentials. In the challenges, we also have the challenges of incumbent momentum in the sense that full higher education, full degrees, traditional education, not only is it not dead, not only will it not die, it has strong ongoing momentum, which will continue. And one of the largest mistakes we could make is turn this into a fight between micro-credentials and incumbents and waste time arguing which one of these is most relevant to education. Uh, the answer is that they're both relevant and we need every tool in the toolbox possible to give perspectives to people who want to learn. And there's going to be plenty of role for traditional degrees and there's going to be plenty of role for micro-credentials. And incumbents have momentum, it's a good thing. It's not something we should spend time arguing about. So linking this introduction to what you'll be hearing about in the rest of the micro AG sessions. Within this overall context, micro AG has defined a number of components of a project. The first is understanding prevalence, understanding how are using micro credentials already. The second part of the project was technology standards, with technology standards actually defining how we should code data, how we should translate data, how we should transfer data. The third part of our project was a technology demonstrator on a credentialing platform. And the fourth part of it was forecasting in terms of looking into the future to see how this will affect institutions more, private, more practically. Um, you will hear more about all of these in the next session. The last thing I would like to say is that the stakes are high. It's important to get this right. 
If we get this right, what micro-credentials promise us is a future with more flexible and personalized offerings. Resolve the opportunity to maybe better resolve skill mismatches. The opportunity to give better educational access to the disadvantaged and the ability for employers to find granular competence in a sea of graduates. These are the we are playing for in this policy field. Thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, wonderful presentation, uh, quite the to-do list. I think it will be a terrific basis for the ongoing discussions that happen today during the uh, micro AG uh, conference. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any time for questions. I would encourage those who posted questions to attend some of the uh, micro AG sessions today uh, where you'll have an opportunity to ask those questions directly on the team members uh, from micro HE. Uh, Diana, I'd like to hand this over to you um, because you had some uh, follow-up comments that you wanted to make. Yes, thank you so much for this, Lisa. And thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Dimitris. And thank you so much, Denise, who managed to overcome quite a lot of stress over her loss of the internet and to do a very good presentation. So I will briefly just share my screen. Uh, to do some uh, technical things and to invite you to the other sessions. So you, uh, again, to remind you that on the Eden website, which is edenonline.org at slash 2020 underscore Timishara, you find all the time the program in the CEST, in the Central European Standard Time, Summer Time, sorry, uh, uh, programs, uh, the hours. So please have a look there if you are not very sure at what time is what session. And then once you have logged in into the conference.upt.ro, which is the event uh, structure where you find papers, other information and the connection, there you can select uh, your time zone and you will be able to see directly in the time zone. I need to say this again because quite a lot of people are asking us also on Twitter uh, and also via email, when is they they are supposed to show up to different sessions? So this is uh, this is where you can find exactly the time. So uh, we will have now a virtual networking coffee break uh, in a different Zoom room. But my colleagues are going to be there. They will going to show you some videos about Romania and allow you to talk and to speak around and to have some networking time. Then we have some parallel sessions where you have all the links into the conference upt.ro. Uh, website and you will be able to join them. I need to drag attention that beside the standard uh, theory, uh, uh, students need and um, paper presentation of full papers. We have a workshop which is presenting the experience of Eden with the webinars, the Monday webinars as we call them, the online together webinars. And then obviously we start the PhD symposium where we have three strands, uh, three sessions in the PhD strand. Uh, Anthony just introduced the micro HE um, workshop where you have other sessions uh, coming up. There are three of them. We will have a virtual lunch break, uh, which I need to remind you again, where our therapist Elena is going to come again live and you will be able to do some uh, stretching exercises and also to be you will be able to have the possibility to chat around and to discuss things. And I want to uh, invite you for tonight. We had quite a lovely virtual tour last night. The recording is already on YouTube of the virtual tour because I got a message from several people asking when the recording are going to be available. And that was an event uh, which we supported. It's also on the e-learning YouTube um, channel beside of the Eden one. So you can also see it there. And we will do the same with tonight, but please join us. Uh, our partners from Ambassada have uh, uh, gave us a, a made available two very nice and very simple recipes. Uh, one is a uh, Grish Kulap and the other one is Sad Male. So you will need to go here to see the recipes and also the videos and to try to do the the cooking, uh, if you have still have time to do that <laughs> until tonight, and then join us. But if not, please bring any of your food 
and a glass of wine or beer or whatever you have at home or nearby Petr, some national uh, drinks. And we will have a lovely chat about uh, community involvement and the cultural festival of Timisoara. We'll have some jazz music with uh, a very famous band from Romania, Bega Blues Band. And we will be joining somehow virtually from a cultural community space, which is called Faber. So please also join us tonight for the conference dinner <laughs> in a virtual space. Uh, so I just want to tell you about, I told you about the Online Together workshop and the PhD track and the micro AG, which will follow. You'll find all the links uh, live into the conference tool. Thank you very much to all. Uh, let's go for coffee.